our next part of this is to talk about continuity. So we say a function is continuous at a if the limit at that value and the actual function value are equal. All right, so we just got done talking about how these are not necessarily always equal, right? The limit doesn't care if it's equal to the function value or not, but sometimes they are. And if they are, we say that the function is continuous. And generally speaking, continuity is a fancy way of saying that I can draw the graph without picking up my pencil, right? This function is continuous. This function is not continuous. I can generally speaking, I can draw the graph without picking up my pencil. Uh, more technically, the limit and the function value are the same. There are some conditions on this. So given that, three things. Whatever that value of a is, we want to make sure that's actually part of the domain of the function. Right? In other words, f of a actually exists. The next thing is to say that the limit exists. We want to make sure that the limit exists, right? If I can't have the limit exist, then it can't be equal to the function value. And of course, therefore, if both of these things exist, we can satisfy our, hopefully satisfy our initial condition here, which is that the limit of the function value, or of the function at that value, I should say, and the function value are equal. If any of these are not true, so if any of these are not true, then we say that f of x is discontinuous, discontinuous at x equal to a. So that's kind of the basic idea. Let's take this a little bit further and just kind of clarify some things. So a whole bunch of different ways things can be dis uh, things can be continuous, being a little more specific, right? I can have continuity on an open interval, so that open interval is a b, and just as a heads up, we're used to seeing open intervals shown in parentheses, right? We know that this is equivalent to saying, uh, sorry, a less than x less than b. Well, iv, and I think it's just to make sure that parentheses don't turn into brackets. Right? If you draw them really quick, sometimes they can look similar. iv, we'll write them with flipped brackets. So we just want to be aware of that, right? I will usually use the standard notation with the parentheses, but if you come across something that looks like this, I just want to make sure you know what it looks like. Anyway, a function is continuous on an open interval, a, b, if it is continuous at every point in the interval. It's pretty self-explanatory, right? It's continuous on this range of numbers if it's continuous on that range of numbers. A function is just continuous if it's continuous at every x in the domain of f. So this is what we said up here, right? We need to make sure that whatever numbers we're dealing with are actually in the domain of f. We say that the function is continuous everywhere if it is continuous for all real numbers. And if it's not continuous, it is discontinuous. That's what I just said above. So let's consider something like 1 over x. Well, let's just get a quick sketch of the function. So something that looks vaguely like this. And then over here, right, I've got asymptotes on the axes. Great. Well, let's take a look at our four criteria here. A function is continuous on an open interval if it is continuous at every point in the interval. Well, it's... We would say, so any open interval containing zero would not work, right? If 
for example, if I said the interval negative 1 to 2. Right, that's not continuous. 0 is discontinued. 0 doesn't work there, right? If I go from negative 1 to 2, well, I've got this little piece and that little piece, and that is certainly not continuous. Right, we say that 0 is a point of discontinuity. Discontinuity point of right. But we can say that the function is con just generally continuous on its domain. Right? If I look at its domain, which is all real numbers except for zero, and I intentionally leave out zero, then the function would be continuous. Right? I, can, I take it in two halves, negative infinity to zero and zero to positive infinity. And on both of those chunks, it is in fact continuous. Of course, we cannot say that it's continuous everywhere because we're excluding zero. And we've already kind of talked about um, zero being a point of discontinuity. So with continuity, sometimes we just want to talk a little bit about terminology. We just want to make sure we're using the right language and being as specific as possible. Let's look at this algebraically next. So here is my function. And I want to determine the value of k, let's increase k, such that f of x is continuous at x equal to 1, right? The way that this is written suggests that x is x equal to 1 is not, um, it's not going to be continuous at that point, is what I'm trying to say. But we might be able to find a way to make it continuous. Right? So in order for this to happen, we want the limit to be equal to the actual function. And one thing you want to know, when evaluating limits algebraically, simplify it as much as you can first, then just plug in, just substitute. So I think we can try to do this first, right? Because realistically, if I try to plug in one right now, I'm gonna have a zero divided by zero situation here. If I plug in one, right, f of one, assuming just that top case, right, is equal to some k, but if I look at the top, I got one minus three plus five minus three over one minus one, and that's zero over zero, and we don't like that. We call that indeterminate because I'll get into that another time. Uh, but we want to make sure this does work. Now, I just said we don't really like 0 over 0, but for simplification, we do. 0 divided by 0 usually tells us we can simplify more. Tells us to simplify more. Well, and what we've just figured out, it just so happens, is that by plugging in one, our numerator is equal to zero. So I have x minus one times something over x minus one. And that all cancels out. I just gotta figure out what this something is. Well, the fact that we know that negative one, that positive one is a root of the denominator tells us that we could actually divide through to find what that something is. So let's see here. I want to divide through by 1. 1, negative 3, 5, negative 3. So we're going back to chapter 3 for a quick second. I'm just doing some real quick synthetic division. And it turns out that I can rewrite this expression as x minus 1 times x squared minus 2x plus 3 over x minus 1, and it just so happens that that cancels out. Well, this is great, because that tells us that this whole entire function up here is really just equal to x squared minus 2x plus 3. And I can certainly find 
a case where the limit and the function value are equivalent here. Right, I'm just going to move my work up here because that's where I have the space. So remember, to be continuous, we want to make sure the limit as x approaches 1 of the function is equal to f of 1. And f of 1 is k. That's just how we've defined it down here, right? f of 1 is k. As I said, when you're evaluating limits algebraically, simplify first, we just did that, and then plug in. So we've simplified as much as we can. Let's plug in 1. I get 1 squared minus 2 times 1 plus 3. So I get 1 minus 2 plus 3. I get uh, negative 1. I get positive 2 equals k. So k equals 2. So when k equals 2, the function is continuous. What actually happens with this graph because of the division, there would actually be a hole in the function. I don't know what this function looks like, but let's just imagine maybe it looks something like this. It's not going to, but just bear with me. At, whoops, at 1, because I can't plug in 1 to my original expression, there would be a hole there, and I would have some point that is k. All right, so the whole point of this problem is where do I need to move k to? Whoa. Where do I need to move k to to fill in the gap, to fill in the hole, to ensure that this function actually acts continuous? And that would be at k equal to 2.